We are here today to um, give you a, hopefully a nice presentation about uh, horses, water, and getting them to drink. Or basically how to get your organization to contributing at all, or contributing more to open source software. I'm Chris, this is Jam. Um, I'll have him introduce himself. But um, I'm a, a developer at NetBase. Uh, I've been developing with Drupal for about five and a half years now. I've been enthusiastic about open source for as long as I can remember. And um, yeah, I'm a Drupal core contributor. In, uh, in the Netherlands, I'm the number seven at the moment for most contributions to Drupal 8, so. Can everybody hear nice. him? Yeah. Yep. Really? Cool. In the end, okay? For Jess, for Jess. Voice. More of it. More of it. Okay, I'll try to speak up. So, but that, that's just about it. That's, that's me, and here's Jan. Hi, everyone. I am, my name is Jeffrey McGuire. Um, everybody calls me Jam, except my mother. And um, I work at a little Drupal shop called Acquia. I was the 18th employee, and um, there's now about 750 of us. It's been my great privilege there uh, for my career to develop in a, in a direction that I think is um, all about contribution and all about um, the really, really nice parts of open source. So, so that's been really cool. My title now is Evangelist Developer Relations. Um, I do the Acquia podcast. I have a series called the Drupal 8 Module of the Week right now, which is fun because I get to highlight the great things that are available, the great functionality that's available for our new uh, major release. Um, I help other people at Acquia blog. I uh, um, generally try and get the word out about open source and Drupal to governments, to businesses, and um, help all of us get more projects, which I like. We are going to talk about <clears throat> uh, contribution in the context of an open source company, and this is uh, based on some research that Chris was doing. Uh, we're going to talk about, so essentially, uh, once Chris gives you the introduction and the background to this, um, I'm going to give a really brief overview that should be obvious to all of us about, hey, why should we be contributing? Um, and then um, talk about why, why in a lot of companies, why people can't and how to make that a possibility so that your open source company is actually also contributing to open source. Chris, how did we get here? Well, basically, I've, I needed to graduate, and I thought that it was a, go a good idea to actually try to graduate into something, doing something that had any meaning for open source. So I got into contact with, a, with an organization, and we just got talking on how, on how I could help them um, do more contribution. Um, and that's basically how my, my research started. And. Um, first thing uh, I did with my research um, was to try to identify what it is that was holding them back with contribution in the first place. So just to give you an idea, they were really um, outspoken about being very open source, very open source minded and actually contributing a lot and that's what they were vocalizing to everyone. And they just wanted to do more. So I tried to figure out what was holding them back. and. Um, I did so uh, by asking the employees uh, a whole number of questions. I, I made a written interview, which they could fill in anonymously, and from that I got some results, which I plotted into a mind map to kind of figure out the way um, these problems they mentioned interact. As you can see, I've made some uh, some bubbles quite purple, and the others more yeah lighter and everything. But the three major problems were lack of time. 80% of the uh, of the employees said, "Yeah, we just don't have the time to contribute as much as we want." Chris. More, okay. So, um, but also they mentioned um, lack of knowledge and doubt, and they didn't they didn't really um, speak up about that. But it was you just felt it throughout the entire organization. Uh, so those were the three major things we I felt we need to needed to address. So I went a step further and I went to uh, try and identify the things that uh, would influence these problems in a negative way. So what would actually um, make these problems bigger? And what I encountered, for example, was that 
the employees within the organization had a kind of a fear of asking each other for help. They, they had a fear of losing face um, by asking silly questions, while they were actually pretty decent questions. But also they just could found themselves um, held back by the, the, the barriers uh, that, for example, uh, that, that lack of knowledge and doubt uh, raised in the sense of the, the, the extra energy they would have to spend to overcome those, etc. And with those in mind, I went off and tried to map some possible solutions onto this um, image. Uh, of which training and guidance and, and um, um, raising proficiency in general um, were the, the ended up being the two key factors. But anyway, so I just made this map and I, I kind of put everything into perspective and all the relationships, all the relationships I could see uh, together. So keep that in mind and I'll Jem will tell you something about the benefits of using open source software and how, we, how I can actually went to solving problems. So a tiny bit more background information. What happened here is Chris identified with a number of developer teams, he, he identified um, essentially operational practical barriers to contribution. I can't contribute because I don't know how or I don't have time and part of his research he conducted a number of interviews and some of them with, were with developers but uh, enough of them were also with people uh, in management roles and we started collaborating on this, uh, this presentation and our plans for after the presentation um, because of uh, a, a fact that really, really caught my attention, it turns out that a lot of managers, a lot of uh, people who run open source companies, and we do open source, and we believe in open source, and we work with open source, um, you know, if you ask them, hey, what about contribution? They're like, absolutely, yes, contribution. But uh, they never had a conversation about it. They weren't on the same page about it. And if you ask them, why do you contribute? Um, they'd say, because open source, right? Which is not very practical. And if you have to build that into a business case, right, or a business plan, or you need investors, that doesn't work so well. Um, so the concept uh, from this point on is Chris discovered people who wanted or needed to contribute. And, um, and so we're going to imagine that we're talking with a company of some size that has a structure that is roughly uh, management and developers, so sort of IT people and manager people who meet in the middle. What I want now is to talk with the manager people about, hey, um, you know, why is open source good? Why, why do we use open source? What's the great things about open source? Now we should all know this, right? But I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Um, when we use open source, we don't have any recurring license fees to use it. Our license fee is zero. We don't have to ask permission to use it, so we have a much lower cost of risk, a much lower investment of testing things out. Um, our development costs are lower because perhaps we don't have to buy, uh, uh, you know, Microsoft licensed developer tools. We can use whatever text editor we want and so on. This should all be obvious, right? If you use a widely adopted uh, piece of software like Drupal, you also have a faster time to market because we have a wonderful module ecosystem. We have people who've built Drupal to be ready to take the last step. You know, it's, it's 50, 80, 90% of the way there to becoming your project right away. Um, all of this lets you work more efficiently, therefore you should be able to be more profitable with it because it's cheaper to work um, to produce a, a quality product. And um, also in a widely adopted uh, ecosystem like Drupal, um, you can work with us today and if you're not happy with us, it's a very standard technology built on standard technologies, and there are lots and lots of other service providers, so you know, there's, not, uh, there's reduced risk investing in Drupal. Drupal looks like a good bet for the future, so it's a pretty safe place to, um, to, uh, to be. And um, we can also, this is a slide I've used a lot, um, not in every presentation I do, but in almost every presentation I do. Um, 
comparing the world of a proprietary software project and open source project, and you can see that every IT project costs money, and most of them cost quite a lot of money. And you know, we have to pay people, and we have to host it, and we have to support it, and we need design and UX and all that stuff. And that's that's every software project, whatever we're using. Um, at the point when um, this power of the license fee of zero means more than a better profit. Um, and this freedom to do what we want with it comes into play, um, we can develop what we need when we need it. We don't have to ask someone somewhere, please could you make this, uh, you know, do also this other thing. And what if you're in a niche business? What if it's not so important to them? You know, maybe you'll never get on their roadmap. But we don't have to ask permission to do new things. Um, and we uh, let you have your own data. And, you know, for the same budget, we can build a better project. So, you know, build better, not cheaper is something that I know that the Acquia salespeople uh, like to tell people. Um, so, paying no, no license fee, you can also hire new people. You can spend your money on your vision. You can train your people to be better and so on. So, great, open source, really good business case. And here's a quick, here's a quick model. Look, if you have a project with a budget of 100 money, right, Instead of spending 30 money on a license fee, you can invest in uh, you know, a better UX and more features and, and you know, more testing, which is something I'm strongly in favor of. So that should all be obvious to us, but it's really, really nice to have it written down and organized uh, and, and thought about if you have to present this to clients, if you have to present this to investors, uh, and so on. So now, all these people who believe in open source, right? Yes. Um, we're all optimists and idealists in open source generally, right? And it's the right thing, of course, we're, you know, contributing and, and, and community, right? That's why we're here. This, you know, yeah, um, except that these are not business reasons, right? None of that pays the bills um, and probably none of that is going to make a sale and none of that has any ROI that is at all easy to measure. I mean, we get to come to Milan and have fun together, right? That's awesome, that makes my life better. That's still really hard to sell to someone else, yeah? So, so this is why we're here. I'm talking with the management about, you know what? Using open source is a sensible choice for business reasons and engaging fully with open source and contributing to open source has just as much of a business case behind it. It's not just the right thing to do. It, it's, it's, you know, if you've chosen open source, it's the only sensible thing to do. So, um, you know, for example, by contributing, um, you, uh, you can raise your company's visibility. Now we have this thing in Drupal where the company and the clients can, can also be added on the commit credits, right? Um, if you're a company that contributes, you're more attractive for open source people. Um, and if you let people contribute, uh, you're probably gonna have a better retention rate. And if you can show that your company contributes to the media ecosystem and you're trying to sell a media project, clients nowadays are savvy about it and there are people who will say, show me, give me the list of your developers, give me their Drupal.org IDs, let me see where they're submitting patches and where they're working if you say you know about media, right? So contributing to Drupal lets you sell better, lets you hire people better, and helps you retain them, okay? And by being deeply involved in your software package, you're going to, by definition, be able to release a better quality product to your clients. Um, you're gonna reduce in-house debt, and so on. So, we're going to talk about two sets of roadblocks to contribution that we've discovered at companies through these interviews. Um, and the one that, that I'm involved in most heavily, we, we call the strategic roadblocks. And these are things that block contribution at an orga organizational level. A lack of vision, a lack of policy, a lack of support for contribution um, across an organization. Chris is going to talk about what we call the organizational roadblocks, and they're things that block contribution on a personal level or on a team level, fear, doubt, and so on, the things that he already addressed. Um, there's a guy called Simon Sinek, or Sinek. He did a TEDx talk in 2009, which is pretty well known, How Great Leaders Inspire Action. And he uh, talked about this golden circle model. Um, so, so, you know, if you start from the what, he says, you're never going to get to a well-organized how and you're never gonna produce results. And organizations that succeed well start with a reason. Why are we doing the things that we do to help them define how they do them to get to 
a great result to get to a what. So we're looking at, um, I'm looking at contribution from this. And if you don't have a why in your organization, why do we contribute? And it's not because it's right, right? Uh, it's got to be a sound business reason. If you don't have a why, you don't have vision and you don't have consensus. And if you don't have consensus, you cannot make a mandate to create policy to enable the people who are blocked to take action. So, if we start with what? We're like, hey, we do open source, of course we contribute, right? And there are a lot of assumptions made at open source companies. A lot of these con conversations haven't happened. Oh, I'm sorry. And these conversations haven't happened. Um, so we have to get to a consensus about the why to create a mandate and to create policy. Um, now, um, you can check out this video. I think I, I, I felt I owe it to him. He also wrote a book called Check, uh, Start With Why. Simon Sinek, uh, very, very, very worth uh, checking out. It's a mental uh, model that helped us a lot. Chris. Right, so as I introduced earlier, these are real um, problems in a real organization. Um, I, I introduced them already, the lack of knowledge, the lack of doubt, uh, the, the, the doubt, the lack of time. And these, uh, the, these things throw up like really um, difficult to overcome roadblocks for developers, especially if they don't have the mandate and if they're not backed by policy and by, um, by management. So, in order to, to um, get into them a little bit more, so you, you have the, the, the lack of time thing. Most, or, um, most employees said this, not just the, the, the employees at the organization I, I did my research at, but I also did numerous and numerous interviews at DrupalCon and other uh, and at other conferences. <coughs> and every single person I asked always mentioned lack of time as being the number one reason uh, why they didn't contribute as much as they did. And, and, and lack of time um, in, in, in an agency, that'll often be something like, oh, I'm not allowed to do something that's not billable out, right? And then, and then at a very small agency, how do we pay the bills and still contribute? Um, and, and we want to propose that, in fact, um, like one of the goals that we're trying to get through with this is to make contribution simply a part of your existence, not a matter of culture, not a matter of choice, but a simple part of the way you work so that the time issue becomes less relevant. Maybe even irrelevant. Mm. So then you have the lack of knowledge, that the how. That is something you can actually um, do something about pretty quickly and pretty easily. Um, I'll get into that later. But it's, it is actually a, a really, really difficult roadblock for people to get, on, uh, get over. Because especially lack of knowledge also feeds the doubt. The doubt in your own skills. The doubt in, is this relevant? Is this something I... I I need to contribute or can contribute. Will it be good enough? Will I be good enough? These are things that are touching people on a very deep emotional level which will actually block them critically. But they're easy to overcome. And then of course you have the, the, the unclear mandate, the why. I mean, if the, if the why is not known, how can people know if they actually are allowed to do stuff? As long as you know why an organization wants to contribute to open source, why it is important to the organization, your developer can actually make his own, decision, his own decisions on um, whether or not this contribution they have in mind is something that resonates with the company vision. And then, of course, lack of procedure. I mean, if a, if, if a company hasn't, uh, or an organization has, hasn't defined what types of contribution they endorse, how is the developer or how is any employee going to know what they are allowed to do? So those are, those are like the five things that will block people and stop them in their tracks when it comes to contribution. There's a disclaimer though. This, this comes from, from one relatively extensive research at one organization. But I can imagine that these roadblocks are um, going to be very organization specific. Um, in this organization, for example, the, the, the lack of knowledge was really a big problem. They just didn't know how to contribute. Um, 
but it's relatively easy to identify. I, found, I figured out these roadblocks in about two weeks' time. It was the first thing I did. I made a, 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 a questionnaire, sent it around, got the results, analyzed them, and in two weeks' time, I knew exactly what the problems were. So let's uh, hand off to Jam again about removing these strategic contribution robots. Right, so uh, Kathy Fays, who's here, um, she and I talked a few years ago about a thing. Uh, so she's, of course, really, really involved in getting people to contribute, right? She does core contribution mentoring and so on, and she has been for years. Uh, she has a thing that she calls the boss talk, right? Which is, no, no, really, you have to let your employees contribute because you're going to benefit from this. And this is a, um, some of my thinking on this topic that definitely started in my conversations with, with Kathy in the last few years. So <clears throat> I want to underscore that this is also tricky because my thinking is about longer term systematic thinking versus quick wins. I would like to help your company um, become, you know, introduce long term profitable systems and ways of working um, over, uh, you know, simply short term uh, uh, billing hours this quarter. Um, and I know that there has to be a balance. I know that we have to pay, pay the bills, but I believe that doing open source right, including contribution, in the end, should make you more profitable. <clears throat> so, um, we see benefits in, in the contribution uh, to projects that you currently use and also to projects that you're not currently using. Um, the, ma the, the majority is, of course, in what you do for your daily business. So, so look, um, there is a clear benefit to letting your developers on the IRC channel, come to Drupal events, come to the sprints, and be mentored by Kathy, Jess, Ruben, all of our people, sit next to Alex, work with Fubi on GraphQL or whatever it is, because they come back to your shop next week better developers, right? They've learned more and they're, um, they're going to produce better code for you. You get better developers by contributing to open source by letting them interact with the community, by letting them write patches, by letting them have those patches be rejected, re-rolling them, and so on. You get better developers out of helping them contribute code and, um, you know, if possible, come to events and be part of that. Uh, there's no better way to stay up to date with what's going on in our community than to combine online interaction with interpersonal action, interaction at community events. Um, in some cases and at some events, uh, being present as a company, being a sponsor, having a table, um, sending developers in your t-shirts, what have you, can be a great marketing action, can be a great uh, uh, customer acquisition action. So that can even help sales. I know that in Italy, where there has been a relatively small number of companies doing Drupal in the last five years, um, I know in some cases, uh, a very specific case, uh, the Drupal Day from three or four years ago, one of the sponsor companies has regularly gotten Drupal business since then, simply because their name was on the website that is still up there. And when people look for Drupal in Italy, in the Italian language, there is not so much material there, and a sponsorship from three years ago is still generating business for uh, a Drupal company in Italy. So sponsorship, right, contributing to, so that we can come here, so that I can be here and speak, um, can also generate business. This is good for your bottom line. There's no question about it. Um, and frankly, if you've got your developers out here, you know, and you um, meet someone who's smart and, and doing great things, but maybe not so happy in their job, or maybe they want to move, or whatever, it's a great recruiting tool. Having, being there, having your developers interact with other people, if you have happy developers who, who, who are allowed to contribute as part of your time, you're going to be able to hire other developers. You'll have a better company. You'll produce better product, and so on. Everybody wins. Um, same goes for um, all these people that you've hired. Most of us hire people nowadays based on their GitHub repo or on their Drupal.org contribution record or what have you, not based on a resume. Um, and we've hired these people because they're good at open source, because they're contributing code, because they're part of the community. If we suddenly lock them away and say, oh no, our code is proprietary, what we write for our clients, you know, you, you, you're not allowed to do that anymore, um, they're not going to stick around very long, okay? So um, it's not a good idea to hire open source people and to then tell them not to open source anymore. Um, 
in terms of producing a better product, your company can reduce technical debt by fixing bugs in the projects that you're using and then contributing them upstream. You don't have to maintain your own patches and your own special versions of things if you contribute the fixes that you make for client projects back upstream. And this means over time, right, the tools that we use become of a higher quality. We can all work faster and easier together. Um, you don't have this benefit if you're maintaining your special. Um, who does a, who's ever done a Drupal project where you have that, that one module which is like patches for this project module? You know, we've all, you, you know you've done it. Right, or, or you know, I met somebody at a Drupal event a few years ago, and this is quite a few years ago, and he came to me, so we have this Drupal site, and we want to know how to just run the security parts of the core updates that come out. Did you hack core? <laughs> 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 yes, they did, so, okay, so, Submit your improvements upstream. We'll all have a better quality product to work with. Everyone gets better security and so on. Um, also, if you integrate testing into your workflows, hello, you will produce better quality over time. Um, so this is, this is a key, this is really, really talking about long-term benefit though. This, this might cost you an hour more uh, 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 interaction in a specific project, but every project you do afterwards using that same module, that same whatever it is, will be better. Um, we have a thing where we have to coach some clients sometimes about, yes, you spent $30,000 uh, for us to develop this module, and yes, we are going to give that to everyone else even though you just paid for it, right? Um, it helps sometimes to explain that when we contribute code into the community, that code comes back better, you know? We get the upgrades for free. Spend your $30,000. We almost guarantee you, uh, so look, 90% of business cases are non-unique, right? Everybody needs a Twitter integration, everybody needs um, Elasticsearch or, or what have you, right? So if we contribute this, um, it's very, very likely to be a relevant business case for a large number of people. If we submit a good idea and there are always smarter people than us in our community, when that idea comes back, it's gonna be more efficient, it's gonna be refactored, it's gonna have five more features. So, you know, the community is also doing bug fixes for us when we're fixing the project along the way. Plus, you know, if our solution gets widely adopted, we guarantee that it will be more secure because unsecure code doesn't survive very long on Drupal.org. That adds real value if you can help clients understand this upgrades are for free concept in a large scale open source community. And um, all of this, I contend, contributes to selling better projects and more projects. Um, and there's a really interesting point that Chris and I, uh, Chris pointed out to me, and um, you need to encourage, um, and this, this is a step further than everything we've talked about, um, apart from contribution in your daily work, which we're gonna focus on now, um, you need to get contribution in your organization to a point where this contribution that is not directly scratching your own itch and directly part of a project, that there's also a place for it, whatever mechanism you want to do. Um, because now, for example, you should be looking at and investigating projects and, and things that you don't use in your daily business. Developers should be free to go and check out Node or Angular or Erlang or I don't care or R or whatever it is just to play around with it because they're also going to come back better and smarter and they might have new ideas for the next client project down the road or to do something amazing or to, to work better and it might pull you away from Drupal. Well, who cares, right? It might also enhance your Drupal. So getting involved in other communities and other languages and other kinds of architectures is actually really, really important and the best way to do that, jump in there, meet those people, contribute to their communities. Um, there's a, a guy called Uncle Bob Who's, has anyone heard of Uncle Bob? He's a programming legend, yes. Uh, he's got a really interesting uh, website and, um, and uh, there's a thing called the Programmer's Oath, which is, which is, I like, it's a little bit old fashioned, I like reading it. Um, um, one of the things it says is, I will never stop learning and improving my craft. And that's really, really relevant to us. So in theory, we have 10 minutes left. I think in, in practice, we're gonna do 20, but then, Okay, so, hey, who thinks contribution makes sound business sense at this point? Four, five, yes. 
Yes, come on, yes. Come on, last one, Salsa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, all right, great. How do we get there, Chris? Well, as you might know, there are loads of ways to, contrib ways to contribute. And I tried to map them all, and don't bother trying to read because you can't. Um, but there are loads and loads of ways to contribute. There's, there's more than just contributing code and more than just contributing documentation. So even if you are an organization that doesn't really have these hardcore developers, but it mainly exists from site builders and maybe a front-ender or whatever, they'll be pretty good at uh, contributing in their own way. As long as they follow their passion, they will find things that they can contribute to. Um, I gathered all this by, by doing a lot of interviews, a lot and a lot of reading. Um, so trust me, there's loads of ways to do it and um, the slides will be published and then you can enhance them maybe a little and uh, look at all the ways. But let's summarize, there, there are four major types of contribution um, and I've ordered these on the perceived impact on projects and community. So, and this ordering uh, I've done by speaking to loads and loads of people and by checking on or, or yeah, listing how many times they were mentioned in literature, uh, literature and et cetera. So the first one, uh, right, let me check this. So yeah, you have, you have code, reviews, documentation and sponsorship. Those are the four major contribution methods people list and, and the documentation list. Uh, code being the, the, the number one by far, um, which is not something I personally agree with though. Um, in my opinion, code review is actually far more important than, um, than just throwing out new code. If you look for example at the, the, the Drupal.org uh, issue queues in general, you'll see that there are probably much more issues on needs review than in need of, an, of, of a patch. And it's, for some reason, people just don't like to review code or something. <laughs> so, of course, the reason code is important is um, there's no open source software without the code, right? Easy enough. And um, by adding new features or modules to the ecosystem, you can actually support reuse and make the, the ecosystem better. Um, by doing reviews though, um, well, they're, they're actually quite essential to code quality. I mean, everybody can put some code on there. That's not that hard. But to make that code really decent and really um, well, secure and have, have a, a lot of quality, you need to ha have a really f good look at, look at it and try to figure out ways how it can break and improve on that. Um, but also they're just part of our um, development process. I mean, reviews are re required to get code committed. So, I mean, who of you have these projects where you have um, known bugs in modules and then there's patches and they've been there for a year and they've never been contributed and you use them in every single project, right? Everyone. And what's the status of the ticket? It's probably not RTBC, it's probably needs review. So how easy would it be to just fix that and review the thing, put it on RTVC and make sure it gets committed. That saves you a lot of technical debt and improves the project as a whole. And well, another great reason to do reviews, like I said, there's just not enough being done. Nobody, uh, not nobody, but not enough people do reviews and uh, they're actually quite important. But also documentation. I mean, how many of you have had uh, situations where you just try to figure out how this, this module works and you try to figure out the documentation and you're there like, all right, there is no documentation or hey, this doesn't work like it's documented or all kinds of things that are wrong with the documentation. Eventually you figure it out and you use the module and be done with it. But why not contribute back some documentation? That's that's something that will help you, your, your future you, when you stumble upon the module again and think, how did it go again? And you'll also help all your colleagues or something like colleagues at other, other businesses and help them get be more productive and actually empower them to spend the time not in researching how this thing works, but actually reviewing improving patches. it and reviewing patches. 
And also, having a critical look at documentation uncovers usability problems. I mean, things that are very hard to document are probably very hard to use as well. So by having a, a good look at it, you can actually uh, figure out where these problem areas are and start and fig figure out a way to improve them. And there's, of course, sponsorship. I mean, these events wouldn't be here without sponsorship. And without these events, we wouldn't be able to improve ourselves and improve the products we, we make. So these are, that's a very sound reason to do sponsorship. And there, of course, there are, there are very uh, many other ways to, to contribute. For example, uh, organize these events or design um, new elements or improve the design of existing um, modules and user interfaces and just evangelize open source software. I mean, there are still loads and loads of organizations that just don't get it. And they don't get it because nobody's ever told them why they should get it, why it is important to do open source. And by evangelizing, we are actually, uh, from a business standpoint, we can actually grow the pie. I mean, we, if you evangelize open source software among your clients, they will actually um, be on the lookout for more and more open source projects, which will lead them back to you eventually with some more business. And there's, of course, loads and loads more, as I showed. So how about removing those op um, operational contribution roadblocks I've encountered earlier? Because, as you remember, that was the problem. Let's solve it. So what are the goals? Well, the goals are to increase contribution proficiency. Uh, proficiency. This is purely a technical thing. I mean, people just have to, the, the employees just have to know how to contribute. What, what should the code look like? Which, which um, processes do they have to follow in order to get code accepted? Um, but also, um, on an organizational, le organizational level, make sure that we've defined um, or changed the organizational policy. And maybe even make some time available for, the, for contribution that isn't client-related. So the first thing is increasing proficiency. Um, that will basically focus on, the, on the, the lack of knowledge and the lack of doubt, and it will influence the lack of time thing. Because if you don't know how to do something, you'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to do it, and that's time you probably don't have. Um, but th it's pretty easy to get, um, get over this. I mean, we're here at, at a conference. Um, you have the DrupalCons as well. There, there are these mentor code sprints. Just make sure that you send your developers to a few conferences and make sure that they attend these code sprints to get mentored by, uh, by people who know how to do it. And they'll learn the process, and in, in learning that, their uh, proficiency will start to, to gain uh, some, uh, so will start to increase. But if you think it's a, a little too expensive to send your people halfway around Europe to go to a conference, you can also just look around in your own uh, neighborhood. I mean, we Drupalists, or open source minded people, we live everywhere. So it's probably pretty easy to find somebody close to you who has a lot of experience contributing and just ask them, hey, are you interested in coming over to our company for a few days? We'll, we'll, give, we'll, we'll pay for your expenses, we'll give you some money, but please train our people to contribute to open source. Yeah. It's a very small investment, and you've trained your people. And after that, after they've got, got like the first um, initial knowledge, they are able to train themselves by sharing their knowledge and sharing their, their experience, and it will be a catalyst and uh, solve the problem in itself. Uh, but you could also just organize internal sprints. I mean, I've, I know several organizations that just organize a code sprint every one or two months on a Saturday and it's voluntarily, and people who like to come and code, they can come and code, even people outside of the uh, organization. And it's a great way to share knowledge and um, increase the proficiency. And also make sure that people share their success stories. I mean, if your developer has had uh, this, this pretty d difficult problem and he fixed it and it's uh, the patch has been accepted and committed, make sure he shares it within the organization, but also outside of it in order to um, evangelize. So, to summarize, if you, if you provide opportunity for training and mentorship, 
your developers will reduce the, spend, the time that they spend for each contribution just because they know how to do it better. And it will make sure that they know what to contribute to in order to have a high impact on the community. And in the meanwhile, uh, and, and while doing so, they will learn uh, the system they work with better, which will make your customer projects be uh, more efficient as well. So now we've gotten rid of the, the knowledge problem. Then what? Well, even if people know how to contribute, they, they still need to know what they can contribute to, uh, what is allowed by the organization. And this is something that has to be uh, unblocked by management. They need to uh, discuss contribution, get some consensus on um, yeah, how, how they um, feel the organization should contribute. So from the why, they need to define the how and the what. And um, just make sure that the, the developers um, have a mandate or a clear policy. And if you're a developer and you don't have a mandate, just go and ask for it specifically. That will usually trigger management to think about these things. And uh, they just, just keep asking them about it and they'll probably end up giving you a mandate. So, Jan, I think you're the, the person to discuss how they should define and change this policy. This ends up... Um, so, uh, basically, there's a, in, in my mind, there's a really, really clear process that, that has to take place where um, you have to understand the business case for contributing all of these collateral benefits that are going to accrue over time from being from contributing to being open source, being, from being good open source citizens. And management can create a mandate, right? Management doesn't have to say this or that even. Management can say, please work out how to do contribution right at our organization, create a policy that we can improve. Um, you know, and the developers can create the policy themselves. The, the, the IT management, whoever that is, can create a policy, and then they're enabled to figure out the right way to do it um, in terms of, of code and workflow and such. Um, management needs to be more specific when it comes to, yes, we are going to sponsor uh, events for X amount of money. We are going to send people, we have budget to send you to, you know, one event a year, two events a year. What, that, that's where management has to be more specific and do their job. But in a lot of ways, saying, understanding why contribution makes the business better um, and then enabling us on the front lines to go and contribute is, is the most important thing that, that management can do. So, um, we've figured out how we can help people be more proficient and we, how they're going to be allowed to do this. Um, now, uh, we're going to talk really, really specifically and shortly for three minutes <laughs> about integrating um, contribution into development workflows. So um, keep in mind that, that contribution involves sponsorship and training and all sorts of other things. But we're just going to talk about like, hey, now put it into your code workflow. And now we're really, really talking about patches. And, and that straight, old-fashioned, getting stuff done. So I've very much oversimplified the process of developing patches and developing documentation, etc., into four steps. Usually you have to analyze the problem, you develop something to, to, to fix it, somebody else reviews it, and then probably that person or somebody else publishes it. This is true for open source projects, but Pretty sure it's also true for your organization. These are just the steps you do um, in development. That's for me, that's for me. That's for you, okay. So let's put these side by side and say, okay, we have a, those steps on an on a, uh, organizational level and on an open source project level. Whenever you develop something in your in your day-to-day -day life, um, be it a patch, be it a module, if you share it, um, you will actually, um, do the development step of the, 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 the open source project. And if you also share your peer review, your code is actually pretty much ready to get accepted by the, by, by the, by the project. I mean, I will never let any poor quality go code go through my peer review, so I, I assume it will be ready for, um, for the project as well. But also, if you find like the, the, the situation I mentioned earlier, where earlier when you have this module which you need to uh, need to patch all the time, if you use a patch, you've probably reviewed the patch as well. You know it's sound. You know it's good. So share the review. Make sure that the patch in question or the issue in question reaches RTBC, so 
it can actually be committed. And also you can improve on the work of others. I mean, we've all uh, probably all have encountered the situation where you're using a patch and it doesn't quite hit the mark. It needs a little improvement, so you improve it. You upload a new patch and you also share the, the, the review you do uh, of, the, of the thing. And once again, you'll end up with an RTPC patch. So by integrating it into your workflow like this, um, you, no matter what you encounter, you'll end up with something that's ready to be committed. Great for the, for the cortex, right? right? And great for you as well, because you reduce technical debt. And this isn't hard. I do this on a daily basis, and it's just five, maybe 10 minutes of extra time just rolling the patch, writing some comments on why it's great, maybe, maybe summarizing the review, and done. It's really, really simple. Really easy to do, really easy to inco incorporate. You just need to know how and if you're allowed to do it. And the result is then, contribution is how you work. There's no, no more fear and doubt. And sure, there will still be problems with lack of time. I mean, even if for proprietary software companies, there's always lack of time. You'll always scope your projects too narrow. You'll also always have some setbacks which will make your lack of time uh, a problem. But that doesn't need to hinder contribution. And when you've made this, um, you've made contribution part of your day-to-day -day work, then it's time for organizations to say, okay, so this is all the contribution we do. We want to um, do even more. So now let's make some dedicated, dedicated time available. Now let's say, okay, uh, each of our developers um, in turn gets a week to work on open source and to tackle these really difficult problems like caching or like, uh, well, the media ecosystem or stuff like that. Maybe you, as an organization you say, okay, we'll just start working on porting the web form mo module for Drupal 8. I mean, that's not something you'll do in your day-to-day -day job. That's something you need extra time for. And that's when you can, as an organization, can decide, okay, so we do all this contribution, we have this little extra budget, let's spend it on making some time available and having our developers actually tackle the hard problems. And the only way that your company is going to come to the decision to set aside actual time and money for more contribution is if you uh, know, the only way the organization is going to set aside time and money for contribution is that if you know for sure that there's a business case behind contribution, that you know for sure that contribution lets you hire better, lets you work better, lets you deliver better projects, right? So this is a really advanced state of this, but it's, and it goes beyond belief. You need to see the proof of this over time. So. so a short recap, I mean, we talked about the benefits of using open source, we talked about why you should contribute, contribute. we talked about the roadblocks you might encounter at your organization and how to remove those. Well, and we're doing a recap, so I think it's now time for the Q&A. So. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask you a question, because we are still uh, looking for um, proof, tangible proof, anecdotal evidence um, of that our theory or thesis is actually true. So if you know people or organizations that actually succeeded open source and actually gained measurable benefits, please let us know. Or if you, for example, you, you had so yourself. Thank you. Christoph. So I, um, benefits, I think, are all businesses built on open source. So without people, you know, we, we wouldn't have built the business that we have. We wouldn't have 25 people working at our company. Like, uh, the, the whole, every, everything depended on, on Drupal and, and Drupal being so open and so easy to set in and, and, and growing and so on. I think my biggest question is about the difference or different ways of contributing. Because one thing is um, contribution as like an operational thing and it's just part of using a project and just contributing back the small changes that you're doing. Another thing is contributing as an investment and uh, like
I, I really like how you frame that as operational contribution and investment contribution. Um, but you said yourself, essentially, your style of, of contributing on the fringes of improving contrib, um, and I know a little bit about your company, right? You are actually making your business attractive for people who need those kind of solutions. You're, you're pr positioning yourself as experts, right? Yes. Right, so that's kind of a contribution as a, a marketing activity. Yeah. I actually, during my interviews, I spoke with Drew Gordon. Um, he um, is currently working at Pantheon, but he um, was the, the starter of um, Gordon Techno Technologies. I mean, how many of you have heard of the Backup and Migrate module or NodeScroll? He made that with his company. And he gave me an anecdote that he was like, yeah, we kind of needed a backup solution where we didn't have access to, the, to, to the, the database itself, to the service. So we just made Drupal do it. And then we thought, oh, let's contribute this and see what happens. And then it just went boom. Everybody downloaded it. Everybody wanted it. And they were like, hmm, maybe we can make a business out of this. So they started NoSquirrel. And then NoSquirrel took off. And then they were acquired by Pantheon for a decent amount of money. Without backup, he's certain that without contributing backup and migrate, he wouldn't have got there. So I, I think the fact that you don't really contribute to core but more to contrib doesn't have to be bad at all. It can actually, like Jam said, profile you as an expert in your field and what you're great at. But it, it creates some, there's some friction there. Because like right now, um, some of the incentive schemes are being geared more towards core contributions. And, and yeah, it, it's. Uh, I think it's definitely a dialogue that needs to be had. I see. I see a lot of um, the consultancies that are going more towards the fringes and that like play in their own little garden in contract. Uh, and often there is very risky, right? Because a lot of these investments never pay off. Uh, and, but it's. Yeah, I think it's how we grow the Drupal market because we are, we're uh, extending the edge of, of what Drupal can do. Um, but it's, yeah, we, we need to watch that and, and somehow do maybe, maybe more research on that. Like, what is the difference between these two strategies? It's being noted. <laughs> yeah, really quickly, I want to give you an anecdote. Uh, a few weeks ago, one of our clients got approached by another company. They offered him double the money, and he refused because we do contributing. And he's very happy with our company. What, what company is that? Uh, Gym Production in Romania. Say it again? Gym Production. Gym Production. Gym Production. Dream production, yes. And the developer stayed with you because he contributed to your company. Yes, and he's very happy with you. Thank you. That's cool. Um, retention. Employee retention. retention. Yes, this is proof. Oh, okay. Cool. Check that box. Um, maybe last question, and I want to just want to very, very like for thirty seconds touch on where we want to go next with this. Please. Actually, it's not it's not a question, but it's it's just a thing that I would add to this uh, is that that we often integrates some third party solutions and uh, in, in, in past we, we already made an integration for, for Drupal so it's a module that integrates for third party solution and we actually get a free account pro, pro free account because we just send them an email and said to them look we made a module and of course they profit as well because there are new users coming to their service and it, we got a free account. So it's, that, I don't know, thirty dollars a month, but it is something. That's still money. Get that, right? That's a lot of figures. Yeah. <laughs> um, so on the same thing, there's this Burda, there's this Burda funder distribution in Drupal 8 now, which is super cool. And I've been involved with helping them write some case studies, and I'm doing an article about it now. Um, and they've got this amazing business model where they have a dis they want to have a distribution. They do have a distribution that is ready for any publishing house of any size to turn on and use and get great value out of it. And they have um, uh, to get uh, user data. They have a quiz service and they have a video transcoding service and they have a few of uh, Facebook. Uh, they have a few of these paid services integrated into the distro. And they went to all of those suppliers and they said, "You must provide a freemium model." So that if I'm a, a little newspaper in Hanover or, or wherever, I can just use this for free and use all the, toys of the tools of the big boys until I get, you know, 100,000 transcodings or this many page impressions or whatever, at which point somebody has to buy a subscription. But they've forced all these providers essentially 
to open, uh, uh, they've given all these, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my marketing trick, they have given all these providers the opportunity now to interact with the entire Drupal community, right? And given the Drupal, and given these publishing houses the, the chance to interact here as well. And so everybody, like this, like, Contributing this integration is a really is a really interesting area as well. So, um, in terms of our presentation, in terms of our ongoing work in this area, um, we're going to be working on uh, the idea of visualizing this uh, mind map of contribution and blockers and unblockers in a few different ways. Um, and we thought clearly that thing is unreadable and unwieldy. Um, we want to do a list ver visualization. We thought maybe that some sort of a Prezi style zooming in and out might be useful. Um, I'm also going to be working with a friend of mine who's an MBA in marketing to write up the same data as a business case, which I think would add a lot of value to this whole discussion. Um, if anybody else has any ideas for us, we're really looking. This is an ongoing thing, and this is like a status report of what we're doing. The next phase, we're speaking with some of the people that that uh, Chris already spoke with and looking for more people to give us evidence of, hey, I contributed and we got this back. And a lot of people are gonna be able to give us an anecdote of we kept someone, we, we sponsored an event and we got a project, that kind of thing. Um, we're also looking for opportunities to look for sort of hard data somehow. Um, and, and we've got a couple of things in mind, a couple of people who are willing to help us, but now we're gonna start backfilling some of this with theory, with proof, um, hopefully blogging about it, hopefully doing more, more sessions about it. And um, yes, so thank you. Thank you for coming and, and hearing us out. Thanks.